Hello and welcome back to the IPA's Looking Forward, a weekly podcast of debate and discussion about politics and ideas. Finally, Australia seems to be moving out of the pandemic discussion into the recovery discussion as we absorb the prospects of suddenly having $60 billion that we didn't think we had Questions are arising about what should we do with it? Should we do anything with it at all? Or should we actually just focus on reform? Lots of reform ideas out there, but none of them are as good as what you'll hear during this program because they actually rely on some fundamental economic truths. To help discuss that, I have, of course, with me my co-host from RMIT University and adjunct fellow at the IPA, Dr. Chris Berg. Good day, Scott. My colleague at the IPA, Andrew Bushnell. Cheers, Scott. And a very special guest, someone who was on the front lines of the last great reform era in Australia in the 70s, 80s and 90s, which were in the direction, didn't achieve everything, but were in the direction of free markets, deregulation and smaller government. And I speak, of course, of Professor Wolfgang Kasper. Welcome to the show, Wolfgang. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, This will be a great discussion and uh, we'll introduce you properly in a moment. Uh, Before we start, I will remind everyone that this is a uh, product of the Institute of Public Affairs. If you'd like to join, donate or see some of our previous podcasts, go to ipa.org.au. Otherwise, whatever podcast platform you're on, make sure you go in and give us a really, really good review right now. Five stars will do nicely. Thank you very much. Um, We won't be having a books and culture segment today because we'll be covering uh, so many great topics relevant to Australia's future and there's no bigger topic than that. Chris Berg, how do we think about the problems ahead? <laughs> what a what a good question, Scott. Thank you for yeah, asking. Yes, yeah, small, small question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I've been really excited um, to have Wolfgang on the podcast for some time now, uh, because Wolfgang, um, Wolfgang, you've been uh, you're currently an adjunct professor at the University of New South Wales, and um, particularly um, of ADFA. Um, but you, your career has. Um, really determined a great deal of the reform movement of the Australian economy over the last couple of decades. Um, The thing that I think um, is uh, one of your most significant contributions to Australia is the document published in 1980 called Australia at the Crossroads, Our Choices to the Year 2000, which you published with a number of colleagues that really spelt out the intellectual basis of the um, economic reforms that need to be done. Now, as listeners will know, for the last couple of months now, we've been talking of the scale of the economic challenge facing the Australian economy after COVID-19. And it would be great to sort of talk to you about um, how you think of the crisis that we're in, given your experience with dealing with crises of the past. Well, thanks for the introduction, Chris. As a matter of fact, I am now old enough to be a professor emeritus. I was never an adjunct. I was oh, my apologies. I meant emeritus. <laughs> I was a full professor most of the time. <laughs> Not full of beer, but sometimes. <laughs> so, um, yes, the University of New South Wales has been running or was running Dumtroon Royal Military College, where I joined. And we then transited to create the Australian Defence Force Academy, where I got quite aware of defence uh, dimensions. And I trust later on we'll talk about that today, what might happen to us in this present confrontation with China. But that's uh, maybe uh, for a little bit later in our discussion. Yeah, so yeah, so, so talk us through just the, the causes of our current discontent. Um, uh, we now have an economy with uh, some of the highest unemployment we've seen in in decades, as far as we can tell, and we've got um, some pretty serious problems on the supply side of the economy. Um, how do you think about where we are today? I think we are in worse condition than I can remember from reading through Australian history. The debt mountain is absolutely phenomenal. The unemployment rate is probably higher uh, than most people expect. A lot of shops, etc., will not open again. Lots of jobs will be lost. And to recoup all that, we'll need dramatic liberalization and the mobilization of the things that make 
for production, namely the mobilization of labor, of skills, the mobilization of capital into the right spots where they are most productive, the best use of technology and innovation, structural adjustment so that we move to those sectors that are most promising in the future. And all that will have to be coordinated and put into place by entrepreneurship, by people who are free to search for that knowledge and explore markets and who have the guts to let some old uh, product, uh, unproductive activities go. So we are in for massive structural change. How do we affect that sort of structural change? Um, the challenges are almost overwhelming, and I don't think I would be want to be in Josh Frydenberg's position right now. But we've had decades of we've we've had decades of sort of contradictory reform. On one side, we've had some really significant liberalisations, but on the other hand, we've got an increasing red tape burden. Thinking through your experience, thinking through previous crises, how would you? How, how do you start thinking about where we have to go? Well, deregulation, both red tape and above all, the violent growth these days of green tape have to go. We need free markets for labor, for capital, for knowledge. We need above all, and that's uh, rarely talked about, a money market that rations rationally uh, scarce uh, capital and money. And the biggest, uh, really, immobilization of the market economy for me as an old, if you want, paleoliberal, is that we don't really have a proper money market. We have negative interest rates. We have controls. We can expect that uh, a lot of these zombie company, companies that only survive at the moment because of very low interest rates will somehow be supported time and time again. We need pro a return to positive interest rates, an uh, interest rate that rations capital and directs it to where it is most productive. That's a very unpopular idea, but uh, I think it's core to what has to be achieved. Andrew, we might bring you in here. Um, Scott Morrison gave a speech to the National Press Club uh, today. We're recording on on Tuesday, announcing, trying to trying to redirect the conversation towards economic reform, or at least as they see it, and we might dig into some of the specifics there. But um, uh, at the first instance, it strikes me, and maybe Wolfgang will comment on this as well, it strikes me that a huge amount of the reform agenda in front of us relies on a very significant political will to do so. I, I think from what we saw today, and I've only seen um, a couple of reports, so um, in typical Morrison fashion, he said some good things, he said some some other things. Um, I saw <laughs> in the category of not good, if you will. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a, a nice way of, of um, avoiding a binary there. But I think he mentioned that um, he mentioned, of course, the need to 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 stimulate growth among small, medium, and large businesses, which is to say, all businesses. Um, but he also, I think, flagged um, the prospect of, of raising taxes um, to pay for all of the spending that they've just committed to. Um, but I was, I was wondering, um, in light of this, this comparison between now and uh, coming out of, as you put it, I think the doldrums of the 70s, um, I wondered if the, the alternative view, and we might get uh, a response to this, um, was is that you, know, you could make the argument that now is not like, say, 1980, and that a lot of the, at the least, the low-hanging fruit of economic liberalisation has already been picked. Um, so I think some people would say going into the 1980s, the, the Commonwealth owned assets and so did the states. They owned assets that they could sell. Um, there was a higher uh, tax burden, so there was more room to reduce it. Um, things like uh, that the government um, was spending more um, as a proportion of, of the economy. Um, I think that's true if you include, if you count GST as a state tax. Um, so I think... Um, the alternative view um, 
that I think would be proposed against this is that you can't repeat that trick, that it's already been done, um, and that what the current crisis reveals is that the structural changes that were undertaken then have actually left us in a more vulnerable position now, and so the response would have to be different. And I was just wondering what the, I guess, what the response to that uh, point of view would be. Well, as the paleoliberal economist, before I answer what uh, Morrison said today, didn't listen to it, we have to go back and learn a bit of, talk a little bit about basic economics. We know that what really matters in these situations, both in the 70s and now, is that we mobilize the supply side of the economy. In other words, we make the best use of our labor, of the capital resources, our savings. We uh, enhance as best and redeploy as best we can the skills, make use of new technology. And all that will only happen if enterprise is free to use new knowledge and uh, go after the market opportunities that will open up. It will, has nothing to do whatever with pushing demand and expanding demand uh, Keynesian style. It is a matter of having high flexibility of uh, these markets for labor, capital, knowledge, etc. And uh, this has always been true. It was true in post-war Germany where I grew up when total... Uh, the, the total abolition of uh, price controls, of uh, uh, lots of government activities that were just put away, led to what uh, ignorant uh, foreign journalists called the German economic miracle. It wasn't anything but that. It was the mobilization of labor redeploying these returned soldiers, building up the capital stock from high savings, and 12 years after the total nadir, the total defeat at the end of the war, the economy was booming and uh, there was full employment. I saw the same uh, economic me mechanism on the supply side when I uh, worked in Spain for a while as a youngster. The Franco statist economy was handed over to uh, technocrats who liberalized, who did exactly what the Germans had done a gen half a generation earlier. And the uh, Spanish industrial production grew faster than in any other OECD country except Japan during the 1960s. Later in life, I moved to Malaysia. Harvard University hired me to become the economic advisor to the Malaysian finance minister. I spent a lot of time in Singapore and Taiwan, etc., and lo and behold, what they did, they opened the economy, reduced uh, tariffs, invited foreign capital in, trained labor, and ignorant economists called and journalists called it the East Asian economic miracle. It wasn't anything but that. It was the mobilization of production factors, thanks to across the board systematic deregulation. Get red tape out of the way. That was the message. In that, in that sense, I wanna, I wanna hey, hey, I'm, I'm, now, I might just interrupt. I just want to say, Wolfgang, that if we actually do the things that we're talking about and we do get an economic turnaround, I don't care if they call it a miracle. I just want the results. <laughs> <laughs> that that there would be a small price to pay, I think, for a bit of terminological inexactitude. I, I, I do want to I, I pick up, um, uh, though, Andrew's question, which is something that I think about quite a bit. Uh, Australia has a fairly open capital economy. Um, it has an incredible red tape burden, obviously, but it's got relatively low taxes compared to many of its competitor economies, not including Singapore, of course. Um, outside deregulation, which of course we're all very passionate about, what, what is there low-hanging fruit left that would make a serious impact? Or do you think we've got to rethink some of those assumptions? Well, there's one very low-hanging fruit is return to the Constitution and let us travel within the country and we'll get a bounce back of tourism. 
will get a cappuccino-led recovery, which will re-employ some people. But that is not what we talk about to get back to high employment, get back to prosperity. Uh, that will need a lot more deregulation. And some of these fruit are pretty mightily attached to the trees, like green tape. Mm. Well, I, I expect a big ideological discussion around green capitalism, will that rescue us? With Keynesian people who think we can spend our way uh, back to prosperity, that economic growth somehow is always created by deficit spending. Mm -hmm. I think we have a lot of these debates, but it will boil down again like it did in the 1970s in Australia. We'll have to return to supply-side economics, deregulation, let economic freedom rip. Can I can I play the the role here of because I'm I would say of the four of us I'm the the biggest economic illiterate by far. Um, I'll play the I'll play the role of uh, of the. We would never say that about you, Andrew. We would never no, say no, no. Well, I've said it about myself, so you're <laughs> off the hook. You don't have to. Um, but I think uh, no. But I'll play the role of the chorus um, and respond to to the argument and, and and see what happens. But I think if the argument is that the existing regulatory framework is essentially stopping capital from being allocated um, efficiently. It's stopping people from who have who have capital or the ability to raise capital from investing in it in, and growing the uh, investing in and growing the economy. Um, the, the the response, obviously, that I think um, our opponents will have, and I think. Um, it's a, quite an easy case for them to make sometimes because I think the public is primed to respond to it, is, well, if what we're talking about here is a lack of, of capital in the economy, why doesn't the government just inject some? Um, and, <laughs> since, and since it's printing money and since it's injecting some, the, the question is, into what? And the left has, a, a, you know, hundreds of years worth of, of items on a list of things it would like to spend all of our money on. Um, one response to that would be, well, we should just choose uh, conservative or right-wing things to spend the money on instead. Um, it, but I guess the, the, the fundamental economic question there is, if the premise is that reform should be about unlocking capital and allowing capital to be directed efficiently, the question that people will have is, why not? Why shouldn't the government just create more capital? Governments don't create capital. They can only spend. Capital is created by people who produce something and don't immediately consume it. Uh, households and firms create capital. And uh, they then uh, direct it to new users, put it into hardware, the factories and uh, the equipment. So uh, government can only borrow. And uh, it's a big misconception these days to think that uh, the central banks of the world can create capital. Of course, uh, what we see in Europe now and uh, elsewhere is that uh, central banks print money and give it to government. But that's not capital. That's uh, just a conjurer's trick uh, and has nothing to do with the productive use of the implements and the tools that make us more productive. But isn't, the argument, isn't the argument that if you, if you increase the supply of money, that there's, there's some, in some sense a, misal, uh, a misalignment of the money that's available and the creative or productive potential of people. And that, you know, if you just print a whole lot of money, then this gives people the opportunity to be more productive and that increases the, the capital base. I mean, if I understand the argument correctly, that's what they're saying. Um, and so what's the danger there of, of I mean, because it looks like we are, um, you know, one way or the other, that's what the government is doing. I mean, even if they have accidentally saved themselves $60 billion dollars um, by not being able to count, um, it seems like that's what what they're doing, and and so, what what's the what's the the danger there? I guess because I think a lot of people would have the the intuition that that might be true. That if you just gave people more money, their production would increase. No, 
No. <laughs> if that was the case, the Brazilian economy, where they have pumped money out like crazy, would be the most productive economy in the world. Let's not confuse <laughs> capital and money, mm. uh, capital in the sense of productive machinery and capital goods with uh, uh, bits of paper. Uh, if uh, Andrew, I think you have sufficiently proven that you are rank amateur in economics. <laughs> but <laughs> let's return to the production side, what we can see in uh, the real economy. People in factories, in mines, in agriculture, using hardware, tractors, uh, new uh, machinery, opening up mines or uh, investing in dams. And these are the real things that we should we talk about, uh, be talking about. Not the money or this uh, crazy idea that the government has saved itself $60 billion. That was just an accounting error and a silly one at that. And... Uh, a miscalculation because they are totally spooked into believing that COVID would be as bad as the Spanish flu, killing hundreds of thousands of people. I, I think the real the real risk that we have here is that um, different interest groups, different factions in the political system, start trying to impose their own vision of a recovery rather than allowing the private sector and entrepreneurs to discover what. The economy is going to look like afterwards because we've done such extraordinary damage to the economic system. We've put so many people either out of work or under in unemployment or underemployment. Um, we we need new jobs, and those jobs are not going to be. I mean, they're not going to come from the RBA's printing press. They're not going to come from um, government plans, or at least they're not going to be sustainable if they come from government plans. They need to be discovered. And and so what we need is sort of small eye innovation at a very rapid pace. And that's the, and, and so, Wolfgang, to your point earlier about the green tape, um, I, I have been observing over the last week or so increasing um, claims made by um, uh, the Australian Industry Group for instance, the Labor Party, that now is the time to think about reshaping the economy after COVID. Take this opportunity to have a um, uh, a low carbon emissions recovery or something like that. Now, that, that terrifies me because rather than just focusing on the one thing that we need to focus on, which is getting people back into jobs, we're going to start overlaying our own ideological preferences on top. Absolutely agreed. Uh, this idea that we should throw existing skills, existing capital stocks away to create green capitalism, to virtually retire the mines because they dig up coal and do other things and create uh, energy in different ways that are very expensive, probably a lot more expensive, would really lead to a long L-shaped non-recovery. There is a real opportunity here to stuff it up for a generation or two. And uh, the, big, the big challenge is really to get the machines going, to use what we got and improve on it, to restructure the economy in the direction where there are new opportunities. And no one in government, no one other than in, in the press, etc., can discover it. Only the market forces, the distributed entrepreneurial skills. And the young people in a free labor market will discover new jobs and uh, uh, f uh, uh, prosper with it. Uh, no one will do it for us. I think it's two sides of the same coin. We're talking about labor markets which actively work against people moving out of whatever they were doing and which is no longer tenable in, uh, into new opportunities, which the new opportunities that we want to be created. I mean, we've already had that for a long time and red tape does the same and propping up industries. I mean, something like say the construction industry has been an absolute joke in Australia. Uh, mass, you know, the ho one of the highest costs, you know, top two or three highest cost construction industries in the world. 
you know, the famous $140,000 for the stop-go signs on a building site. Uh, Chippy's, Chippy's assistants are on like $130,000. These are pulling employees away from the from the manufacturing industries that everybody, you know, suddenly wants to have in Australia. It's like, can't, can't we have manufacturing in Australia? Well, why would you work in manufacturing um, when you can get $140,000 a year for turning a stop-go sign around? And, of course, there's been an artificial moment market in in construction created by um, uh, rapid population growth, low interest rates, superannuation funds, pumping members' funds into the construction industry. This is what we mean by a a misallocation of resources. And and this is, I think, uh, I try not to be pessimistic, but I I think Wolfgang's right when he says in some ways we're, we're actually going into this process from a worse starting point than 1980. Um, and 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 also we shouldn't believe one of the one of the um, slightly different point, but one of the myths about those reforms of the 80s and 90s is that they completed deregulation process and they completed the deregulation of the labour market. Uh, they only ever got halfway there, and everything that was achieved has been completely unwound since. You know, there is, the labour market as it is it works completely against people moving to their highest and best use and being rewarded in an appropriate way. So um, we've talked about capital, but it's also labour and it's also red tape. Um, but there won't, be, there won't be opportunities for people unless entrepreneurs are allowed to create those opportunities. People will not know what to do. All these poor people have want to discover. I heard that in Asia when liberalization was proposed by us uh, foreign economists uh, in Malaysia, for example, said, well, these villages know nothing about industry. These Malaysian girls uh, who ought to have jobs, they won't know how to go about it. These people, when exposed to free market forces, were very smart and discovered lots of things that has made Malaysia much richer. The same happened in China after the communist regime of Mao was liberalized economically. China is now de facto a capitalist country with the dictatorship of the Communist Party with no uh, political freedom. People discover when exposed to markets. And there's always a demand, tell us where the winners are. You are the experts. No, we are not. It's millions of entrepreneurial people and some very modest people who discover how to stitch uh, clothes together differently than before. It's not all high-tech CSI or O-level innovation that we talk about. It's discovering uh, how maybe to regulate the traffic along the road without having... 10 workers holding up stop-go signs, <laughs> maybe using an electric light. Uh, who, who knows? Uh, such innovations could all, only ever be possible. Um, uh, before we move on to um, the other topic that we wanted to cover today, I thought that there's, uh, this is a little bit of a topic without notice, but in this speech that Scott Morrison gave um, to the National Press Club, he seemed to be trying to announce a sort of new Accord, so the famous Prices and Income Accord from the early 1980s, which was revised over and over. And I'll quote from a news report. Uh, Mr. Morrison used a speech to the National Press Club to announce Industrial Minister Christian Relations Minister Christian Porter was going to lead a new process bringing together unions, employer groups and businesses to change the current system. They seem to be shelving a bunch of um, uh, existing industrial relations reform proposals that have been sort of moribund in the parliament and trying to get everybody around a table again. Um, I've been very critical of the Prices and Incomes Accord of 1983. Um, It's often forgotten that it didn't include business. It was a, a accord between government and the labor unions. But more fundamentally, this sort of corporatist approach to reform. Andrew, I know you've been very interested in um, uh, the relationship between the sort of elite industry bodies, elite union groups, and of course, the government. Is there a way forward? Is there a way forward for political 
reform and economic reform um, in this environment. When you hear something like what Scott Morrison is talking about, are you worried? Are you thrilled? <laughs> How do you think about that? And then, then we might ask Wolfgang his reflections. Well, the, rec- the accord was really an accord in the end to have a productivity underhang. It was a great mm. break on productivity growth. <laughs> it was a disaster. And when I hear about a new accord coming, that's the corporate state. It's not the free market economy where lots of different people get engaged and search for it. Governments are very good at prohibiting things. They were very good at uh, locking us down. But now <laughs> we want our freedom back. All Turns of out they're us. much worse and, at uh, opening it up again. Yeah. <laughs> and also the freedom, please, uh, of uh, acting in the labor market uh, as we see fit. If someone wants to work for half the salary because it's a secure job, let it be. Maybe in a year they have created some activity that is a ripper and that uh, makes people very rich in a new activity. An accord with people sitting around the table is just a damn squid and half a guarantee for an L-shaped non-recovery. Andrew, is the is the only way through big business, big government, and big union getting together and figuring out the shape of our well, economy? No, I mean my my own views, of course, um, won't surprise anyone given where I work. But my own views um, do trend in the opposite direction um, towards uh, more decentralisation. Um, but I think, I, I guess the best way I get I can answer your question, I guess, is to is to return to something you mentioned at the at the top and and perhaps clarify um, my motivation for for pressing the point that I have done in the last um, thirty minutes. And that is, you raised the idea of um, ideology, um, and I think. From, from my perspective, um, now, as I said, not an expert in economics, but I do know something about political philosophy. Um, and I think that um, from, from my perspective, I think that the centre-right has perhaps um, a need to, when we talk about innovate, one of the things that needs to be innovated is the way that we explain our ideas to people in the current circumstances. Um, and I think... There's, there's particularly among conservatives like myself. There's a there's a real aversion to ideology, to systematic thinking. But in a mass democracy, I think it plays a really important role in explaining to voters what it is you would do if they actually gave you power. Um, and so the reason for for pressing the point, as I have done here, is because I think one of the things that we need to uh, innovate and 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 a sort of competitive discussion back and forth about it is one way to go about doing that. Um, is to find a, a story, I think, that explains why, say, something like Scott Morrison being in a room with Sally McManus is not actually the answer, that there's a lot more going on, not just in the economy, but in the society that the economy is a reflection of, um, that simply those two people, um, galaxy brains though they may be, um, <laughs> won't know. Um, and so... Yeah, as I say, my, my concern here is that um, while it is good, obviously, and as a conservative, I would never say otherwise, is we need to learn from the past. Obviously, the circumstances of today are very different. There's been a, a number of changes that our economy and our society has already undergone over the last 40 years. And the, the story from then does not translate uh, to people's lives directly now. How, how do we, let's let's just follow that up for a bit, Wolfgang? How do we tell that story? I mean, right now, I think that the story is really obvious that we've got really significant unemployment, and um, the economy is in the doldrums. But but how how do you think about the story that we're going to need to tell not tomorrow with opening up the lockdown, but for the next five years as we try to get back to the prosperity of twenty nineteen, for instance? Well, maybe we're talking of political philosophy, let's go back to Locke. There are two types of political power. We want freedom under the law, not license, and not uh, the monarchy, uh, the court of Morrison and Sally McManus uh, uh, dictating to us uh, what is done and thinking hard about... By far the worst court. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) No, no. 
let's go back to Lockean freedom, to the insights of the Enlightenment, to Adam Smith. As soon as these people click together, they will just uh, agree how they will feather their own nests. And uh, we, we have all sorts of uh, dangers in the wings because we will be threatened uh, by an aggressive China. There will be pressures uh, on a Morrison court uh, with uh, Sally McManus deciding our future uh, to have more manufacturing. We, you know, we had two weeks where face masks were obviously scarce. Do we create a national face mask industry? How do we do that? By tariff protection? Yes, of course. Uh, that's a very big danger because all these people then can do is prohibit certain activities instead of letting competition rip. It's almost anathema. We have to retell the story of economic freedom. Yeah. So that's a good um, segue, Wolfgang. Thank you for that, into um, the second topic that we're hoping to cover with you today, which is um, uh, the new protectionism that I'll, I'll call it. So uh, two obvious things have changed. Um, the first is what you've mentioned which is that we've got some, we've discovered, I should say, some pretty serious supply chain issues, or at least some supp serious supply chain issues in the first couple of weeks of the crisis. And that has brought out a, um, uh, a call for more domestic manufacture, of, obviously of um, personal protective equipment and face masks, but also of things like pharmaceuticals. And there has been some claims made about the reliance on um uh, on overseas manufacturing, particularly Chinese manufacturing. Um, again, that's what we were hoping to talk to you about. But over the last couple of days, or at least the last week or so, we're, we have discovered ourselves to be in a trade war with China. China has introduced really steep tar tariffs on barley, arguing that we're dumping subsidized grain. There are even reports that the Chinese government is um, threatening coal shipments from Australia to China, um, there are lots of beliefs that this new trade war is because of um, uh, arguments that we've made on the global stage about China's responsibility for the pandemic initially. What I throw to you, Andrew, first, though, if you wouldn't mind framing the issue as you see it, where are we now? We had a relatively free trade economy in 2019, and it seems like we don't anymore. Yeah, the, the, the China issue looms largest, I think, in Australian politics. I think it is um, the, the biggest issue. Um, it's only five years ago that we signed a free trade agreement with China, um, but our relationship with them has uh, significantly deteriorated since then. What I would say is that in the 20, 21 years since China became a member of the WTO, obviously this was uh, touted as... Um, you know, a, a great growth opportunity for Australia and the West. What you, what, to put the, well, to put the point as strongly as possible, um, at the risk of overstating it, in the, the whatever money, whatever money we got out of the last 20 years of this relationship is now all gone. Um, the current crisis has erased all of those gains. Um, and there's no doubt that the Chinese government, um, you know, beholden to a, a somewhat nefarious ideology, to say the least, um, has contributed to the harm that this virus has caused Australia and our friends. Um, and I think that uh, what we are looking at, actually, if we're talking about uh, innovating, restructuring the economy, what we are talking about is a quite rapid move away from our engagement with China um, I don't think we have a choice about that. That's how I would frame it. Wolfgang, is this desirable? Is this um, regrettable? How do you how do you think about the the China restructuring, uncoupling? It is very regrettable what's happening, and there's no easy answer to that. Again, let me go back a step. After the Australian economy had opened up the defense establishment were very worried about the consequences of uh, globalization. All of a sudden, we didn't have a car industry, which was always deemed as a backup for potential military repair and production. Uh, of course, we were importing uh, ships and uh, 
aircraft, but uh, we still had more self-sufficiency. I was involved in the 1980s in big discussions with the defense de within the Defense Department about the consequences of that. What do we have to do to maintain national security in an open world economy? And there were two big ideas uh, emerging. A, we have to sacrifice some economic welfare to keep certain stocks here, to keep certain uh, repair facilities here, to subsidize uh, aircraft that could, in an emergency, transport the necessary materials from the United States to Australia. The second thing that emerged is that uh, a lot of people were preparing to fight the next war, a long blockade. And uh, many military experts were saying, no, it will be a quick nuclear exchange. We don't have to prepare for five years of blockade where we can only fly a Catalina to Ceylon to send some letters uh, to England. The next war will be different. Now, uh, that problem between the trade-off between security, protecting ourselves, which is a primary function of government, and prosperity, thanks to globalization, the open trade and investment, that conflict is very real. And we have been reminded the last few weeks how real it now is with China, on whom we have become excessively reliant. I thought... I, I was horrified when I learned that China was admitted as an equal partner with some preferences to the World Trade Organization. They weren't ready. I was horrified when I learned that Trump, on assuming office, chucked, uh, immediately chucked the Asia-Pacific partnership into the waste bin. That was an uh, alliance of the willing free trading decent economies with the rule of law uh, in the Asia-Pacific. Now, that was rescued halfway by the Turnbull government, but it's not what we really thought, namely a U.S.-centered big free trade area. So we are now caught between uh, Trump's America and Xi Jinping's China, a China where the primary political uh, Maxim is how to uphold the political monopoly of the Communist Party in a free capitalist society. Are these two separate stories then? There's the, there's the supply chain problems that we've discovered from the pandemic, which may have been quite short term. Certainly in Australia, they've been discovered to be relatively short term, although there's lots of um, things like computer equipment are hard, a lot harder to get because a lot of them were reliant on global trade. But then there's the other story, which is that we've got a particular problem with a particular country. Yeah. Um, now, uh, the defense argument has always been the last refuge of the protectionist scoundrels. And <laughs> it's being revived partly by pretty shonky industrial interests. But they're also respectable military people who think hard about how to secure our position in a conflict. So I would, for example, go along quite happily with a petroleum reserve on shore that would uh, give us more breathing space for a few weeks. As, a, as opposed to stored in the United States for some reason. <laughs> well, yeah, that's only a temporary thing. Maybe we bought it cheap and maybe it's excusable, but that's... Uh, <laughs> that's just phony. And we have said that on looking forward over the past couple of weeks, that that is the difference. They are two different things. One of them is about discovering that you, as a country, you don't make everything yourself and like, oh, my God, and some people immediately leap to, we should make everything here. We should make our own cars and our own face masks and our own ventilators. I mean, one of the things I've observed is, you know, how many hundreds of companies in Australia have suddenly announced their, their incredible capability to build ventilators just at a, at a time when it was becoming obvious that we actually didn't need many ventilators at all. Um, it's a and classic didn't sort have of, people uh, to handle them. 
Lots of people exactly. around the world have been killed by the ventilator because unskilled people shoved the tubes down the wrong uh, tube in the throat. Exactly. So this is a classic example of where you know, the, you know government leaders say, oh, my God, we need more ventilators. We must mobilize our manufacturing base. Uh, and everybody jumps in the same direction. And it was all pointless. It's not a real market. It's not a sustainable market. Um, some beautiful designs and some beautifully constructed products with no actual use. That's what happens when governments get involved in saying what products we should be making. So, but that that all comes from this obsession with self reliance in everything, which is which is self evidently bad. As opposed as opposed to the China issue, which is more of a strategic decoupling, because we might say we want it made in, um, as you say, a, a decent country with a rule of law. Uh, and we're just as happy with that, but we're not reliant on China. Yeah, we're not. We're not alone. We're not alone in this problem, right? That um, that that China is not just a strategic rival of Australia, obviously. Um, and so we're not alone, and we don't need to think about ourselves um, as being alone when we talk about moving away from our um, economic uh, integration or over reliance on China. We need to remember that um, we're not the only country that faces this problem. And, and, and to anyone who's sort of sceptical about that, I mean, the example I, I always use is, well, when you talk about, say, um, foreign uh, ownership of land in Australia, I think the, the, the most or the largest share of land that's owned by foreigners is actually Dutch agribusiness. Um, and no one knows that and no one cares, right? Because the Netherlands is a rule of law country. We know because they're incredibly wrong. subtle colonialists. Is, yeah, got uh, yeah well, this, this is a very spiritual. long game that the Dutch are playing. <laughs> I think we're pretty we're pretty safe, and so um, we're not we're not alone. Um, and but one one thing that I would say that there's a there's a, a real um, danger here um, that we haven't faced, I guess, for a, for a long time. Not perhaps since the sort of Red Scare period is that is whether the the political class actually has the will to take on this problem um we've seen here in victoria a government that is actually more stridently pro chinese communist party than pro victoria or pro australia um and that when when pushed on their relationship with the ccp um uh, are not shy about attacking everyone else as racists and i, I wonder if the the in the, you say, uh, uh, Wolfgang, that, um, and this is true, I used to work at the Department of Defence, so I heard these arguments a lot as well, um, that um, people will use the defence argument as a way to promote um, protectionism generally. And traditionally, that was what um, the Labor Party sort of used defence issues for. But at the moment, you'd have to say that the, the Labor Party is unlikely to go down that path because um, they don't actually want to take on this this China issue, which is very divisive for them internally. Um, and so if if we see, this is a prediction, I suppose, more than a question, but if, if we were to see one side of politics uh, adopt that protectionist mantle under the guise of defence, it's much more likely, I think, to be um, the conservative side of politics. Yes, there are many conservatives, but the real thing is not the political will, uh, Andrew, as you said, it's the capability. The modern economy relies on so many highly specialized bits and pieces that we cannot all produce here. Even, you know, a Boeing 747 airliner needs to fly safely 17,000 different spare parts. I've been in the hangars in America where these little needles and nuts and bolts were stored, were called off. And a lot of these bits and pieces in our modern Australian economy come from China. That's why I am horrified by the prospect of people saying, let's decouple from China. We cannot. It's a, not a matter of political will whether conservative or labor, it's a matter of not being able technically to do that. But we may that... not be. We may not be, but our more friendly countries may be, right? So isn't this, isn't this, this is, a, this is an, an old, um, I guess, critique of, of um, 
the whole concept of comparative advantage is that it's it's kind of logarithmic, right? That after a, once your trading block is a certain size, you've basically got all of the capacity that you need. You don't need the whole world. The gains become more and more marginal the larger your trading block becomes. And so if these components were built in the United States, um, then that's much safer for us um, over the longer term than than the current situation. Isn't that the yeah. case? Comparative advantage is something from the 19th century and a static concept. We live in a dynamic world and competitive advantage changes and uh, develops all the time. Now, uh, okay, let's diversify away to friendly countries, as you call it. Which countries? United States may be very expensive. Production out of Europe, they are friendly, but uh, do they compete uh, with the cost and frequently the quality uh, uh, and the diversification that the Chinese now bring to the world market? Uh, this is a real problem. Others see great uh, help out of coming out of India. I think that's a total joke if you see the quality and the reliability of Indian industry. Where are we turning uh, to get away from this, uh, in the world, not only Australia, in the West, from this uh, interweaving with the Chinese economy, which is dynamic and low cost? But isn't, isn't, isn't this whole discussion, isn't this whole discussion a perfect example of the planner's fallacy, that we are sitting in our studies and home offices as we're um, constrained to do so and trying to figure out where private companies can source materials. Now, I think the big lesson of the pandemic, particularly as it's affected supply chains, is to teach private companies, much less the government, but private companies, that a lot of the supply chains that they thought were more resilient than they were, were actually um, highly susceptible to geopolitical risk. So there is not a supply chain manager on the planet that isn't thinking about diversifying themselves. This doesn't have to be a policy from Scott Morrison's office. This doesn't have to be a policy from the Victorian government or whoever. I think that entrepreneurs are now reassessing their assessment of the risks of supply chain reliance on on a country like China um, uh, and 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 we're, we're just spectators here if you know what I mean I, and I would encourage us to I would encourage us to remain spectators no, as a pol as a policy no, this naive globalization also <laughs> no, just quickly as a do you say the planners fallacy and I take your point but as a as a policy question global free trade globalization raises the exact same concern. So you make this decision um, to engage your country uh, in the entire with the entire world. Um, this is a this is a policy question. The costs and benefits of which you cannot know a priori. It's it's and 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 when something like this happens, when you get an effect like this pandemic that tanks your entire economy, you need to. That's that's a relevant data point for thinking about this policy. So. You know, the, 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 this is, again, like an old political philosophy question, but when you're choosing between liberalism and some other system, liberalism doesn't give you the resources to make that regime-level decision. Um, and that's the, I guess that's the question, that, that's, that's why we've come to this political juncture that we're at, where you see um, conservative or national conservatism as it's been branded or populism or, or whatever and you also have a kind of illiberal left-wing progressivism um, we've come to this juncture because we're actually reaching a regime level turning point I, that's what I would submit Chris is absolutely right globalization is not driven or stopped by governments they can stop some aspects of it but it's hundreds of entrepreneurs and they'll get around controls. The only way governments can stop it is to reintroduce tariffs. So we go back to assembling shonky cars in Australia for double the world market price, have 10 varieties of cloth instead of choices of 10,000. This is just, uh, this is just wrong. Uh, 
free markets, free investment will uh, just bypass uh, most of these controls that conservatives seem to have in mind. No one has told me how we can create more manufacturing in Australia other than by tariff and prohibitions. And no one is talking about what that costs. I was just going to observe too that um, uh, from the Chinese perspective, you know, that probably somewhere in China there's, you know, four people on a podcast uh, making very similar arguments about their reliance on the rest of the world for the things that, that they need. When they put the scare up the Australian coal industry and saying, well, we're going to start buying more of our domestic coal, that was written up in Australia as if it was, you know, solely because they were sitting around determined to punish Australia. But in reality, these are just, when you have sort of mercantilist, um, you know, state-driven planning sort of approaches, that's that's what you start to do. You start to say, oh, my God, we're buying all this coal from Australia. We're, we're totally dependent on Australian coal. We better use more domestic coal, even though it's higher in ash and, and um, lower productive and, you know, more CO2 rich and all these, all these things. But, um, you know, from the Chinese perspective, and I, and I have been there in the last couple of years, thanks to uh, the generosity of various Chinese companies. Thank you. It was a lovely trip. <laughs> um, but that, is, that, of course, is there, is there is another layer of an argument about being a little bit concerned about strategic decoupling. I, I'm actually, uh, as Wolfgang was saying before, I'm, I'm quite comfortable with notion that you might declare certain industries uh, to be strategic priorities and strategic reserves and all these sorts of things. But it may be that there just is no reasonable approach to, to uncoupling from a whole country across all of your supply chains. And we just have to find some way of declaring what is strategic and what, what just isn't. Because if if one of those 17,000 parts for the Boeing 747 comes from some guy making bolts in Guangzhou, that probably actually has nothing to do with what Xi Jinping uh, did during the early days of the coronavirus pandemic. And, and maybe what we actually need to, is just keep those things separate for some time and, and concentrate instead on how, how we can make ourselves more competitive. T tell you what I also worry about that. I, I worry that the argument for strategic decoupling in the middle of the um, biggest economic crisis of our lifetime is precisely the same as the claim that we need to have a renewable energy driven led recovery. I think right now what we have is a unprecedented economic problem where we should have one goal, which is boosting economic growth and productivity, jobs, productivity, productivity, productivity and supply chain adjustments, um, supply side um, uh, entrepreneurship and innovation, um, and uh, which is not to say that you can't do multiple things at the same time, but we should not let anything prevent us from myopically pursuing that singular goal, getting our economy back to where at least it was. <laughs> not even getting rich, just getting as rich as we were. Yep, I totally agree. Big experiments, throwing our present capital stock away to do it totally different is just suicidal. And we can't afford it. We owe it to the next generation not to go more and more into debt, not to destroy a lot of the jobs and the productive capital that we have. We have to build on what we got and we can do it. But we can only do it if we let individuals discover it with economic freedom behind them. Governments cannot help us very much there. <laughs> what a beautiful summary, Wolfgang. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that is that is a very um, uh, lovely conclusion, I think, a, a wrap-up indeed for everything that we, we have been talking about uh, for the last hour. Um, Wolfgang, thank you so much for joining us on uh, Looking Forward and also for the the article that you've contributed to the IPA review, which will be going into the winter edition where you flesh out some of these, these themes. It's been great to hear from you. It is a pleasure, and I'm happy to take on the defence hawks, the radicals in the defence department, any time. And I did want to thank you too, Andrew, because looking forward is about finding the language to speak to uh, the, the underlying values of freedom that we do share – 
um, the the messages that worked in the 1980s. It won't be the exactly the same language that worked, but you know, there's some very important principles in the background, and that that's what this uh, podcast is all about that we're trying to figure out. So thank you for your contribution today. We'll be putting some uh, some links up in the show notes, including to Australia at the crossroads. Um, Chris, and, and thank you for uh, framing the discussion on the way through. Thank you, Scott. Good. We'll be back with more. And thanks also, of course, to uh, Josh Stranger in the virtual studio for putting all this together. We'll be back with more Looking Forward next week. <laughs>